Hi everyone, uh, welcome to lecture. Uh, today we have a guest lecture, uh, Josh Dobin. Josh got his PhD in AI from Berkeley. Um, has been a research scientist at OpenAI for several years and uh, is one of the world leading experts, I would say the world leading pioneer in uh, sim to real how to make robots learn in simulation and have it still somehow work well in the real world. And that's exactly what we're going to learn about today. Um, before Josh gets started, a couple of quick logistical things. Um, you have your last homework, your homework five is um, out and due in about two weeks, so keep track of that. Um, and then your midterm has happened, uh, if, if you missed it. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and then final project presentation, time slot Paul has gone out. We'll look at that soon and then we'll send out something for signups in the next couple of days so you can pick a specific slot for your team. Um, and if you have any conflicts with all the slots, we'll figure something out, probably with uh, you doing a recording for us ahead of time. All right, any logistical questions? Okay, then please join me in welcoming Josh. All right, thank you, Peter. I'm really excited to be here. Um, before I dive into um, the topic of today's talk, which is sim to real just a bit about me. Um, my background was in pure math. Um, and then I you know, decided that I wanted to like, do stuff in the real world, went into consulting for a little bit, um, but missed being technical. So I came back to Berkeley to do my uh, PhD in applied math. But um, little did I know when I came back to Berkeley that um, I would uh, do one thing that would change it all, which is actually to take this class. Um, and so I took CS287, I think the last time it was offered, around four years ago. Um, and that sort of changed my trajectory from math to robotics and artificial intelligence. Um, spent time at, uh, doing those things at OpenAI in Berkeley. Um, so the first thing I, I want to talk about is just, you know, what, what was my like, takeaway from CS287? Actually, um, I'm curious, you, know, you, you all are almost done with the semester. What is, what's your like, main takeaway from this class so far? Any takers on this question? Josh wants an opportunity to throw this box. Yeah, I, I really do. Or maybe no one's learned anything from the class. Yeah. LQR. LQR. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Um, that's, uh, that's not exactly my main takeaway, but I definitely did take that away. Um, my main takeaway was get started early on homework five. It's, uh, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, I, I think like, the, thing, the thing that I took away from the class more than anything else is that you know, robotics is really hard. Right? Um, and so why, why is that the case? Right? So you all have talked about um, you know, the simplified model of how robots interact with the real world, which is an MDP. But I think one of the, the core things that makes robotics so hard is that the real world really isn't an MDP. Um, right? So in an MDP, you have an agent that um, gets to observe the, the ground truth state of the world. But in the real world, um, you know, states are super complex and they're ambiguous and they, they're really hard to model. And so these are all kind of examples of scenes where you should think about how would we actually model the state of this. Um, so what the robot does get instead of the state is an observation. But the observations themselves are often really high dimensional um, and they're multimodal. So maybe they have many camera inputs. Um, and then they're also super noisy, right? Um, so the, even, even though we do get an observation of the world, that observation might not be reliable. The next assumption that we have in an MDP is that we get a reward. But my question is, you know, where does reward come from in the real world? Right? So if you're trying to have a robot pour a cup of coffee for someone, how do you actually um, set up a system that will give you a reward back when they do that task successfully? And a couple of other um, examples that you might want to think about is, what does a reward function look like for folding a towel, or for um, you know, cooking someone dinner, or you know, ultimately like, making their user happy? Right? How would you define a reward function for those things? And then even if you can define a reward function, a lot of times our reward, measuring our reward relies on having sensors to tell us sort of where the robot is in space. So how do you measure reward outside the lab? And then lastly, actions that robots take. Right. So um, designing controllers for robotics is a really hard engineering problem. You need to understand the system that the robot is interacting with very well. Um, and it doesn't always scale that well to high dimensions. Um, I like this quote from uh, Russ Tedrake at MIT and TRI. 
um, which is that you know, manipulation, like maybe one of the main things that we care about in robotics, breaks all of the rigorous and reliable methods for control that we know about. Um, and then once you do get your controller, you know, your robot is going to break, and it's going to degrade, and the sensors um, are going to, going to fail. And so how do you make sure that things are reliable for that? And so one thing that I was really excited about when I took this class is deep reinforcement learning and you know, deep learning more generally applied to robotics. And so you know, I think the, the hope there is that rather than like us needing to spend a ton of time understanding the environment that the robot's going to operate in, maybe we can just collect a lot of experience and let the algorithm handle the rest. And so um, the next thing I want to talk about is like, what's preventing us from doing that? Why is this so hard? And so I think the, the main observation here is that deep learning is super data hungry, right? So from uh, you know, training models and images to uh, sentences to robotic control, you really need like often millions or tens of millions or even more sort of labeled examples in order to get things to work well. But for those of us in, for those of us in robotics, that presents a big challenge, right? Because robotic data is super expensive. Um, robots themselves are expensive. And you know, actually going out and collecting data on robots um, can be dangerous. And then um, it, often in the real world, it's hard to actually get labels for the things that we care about our robots doing. And so one of the main things that motivated me when I started working on my PhD is how can we get around the data availability problem in robotics? So is there any way to make data more plentiful so that we can do deep learning in robotics? Um, there's a few ways that people have thought about approaching this. Maybe if the problem is we don't have enough data, like let's just scale up data collection. And so some research, researchers have thought about how to make fleets of robots that all collect data together and learn from their shared experiences. Um, maybe if the problem is that our learning algorithms are too inefficient, maybe we should just make them more efficient. Um, and so more efficient than sort of model-free reinforcement learning could be model-based RL, um, meta-learning, and learning from demonstrations. And I, I know that you've talked about at least two of these um, model-based and um, LFD in the class so far. Or you know, maybe another way to get around this is if, um, if the problem is, it's, one of the problems is it's really hard to get labeled data in the real world, maybe we can do a lot of our learning in an unsupervised way. Um, and so I think you know, all of these approaches that I've sort of touched on at a really high level so far are really interesting and I think are going to be a big part of the story about how robots make it to the real world. But the question I want to focus on is um, what can we do without doing that? So what can we do with simulated data? And you might ask, you know, why, why would we even bother with simulated data at all? Well, if simulated data works, it has a lot of really big advantages. So unlike robotic data, simulated data is super cheap, um, basically zero marginal cost. It's uh, very fast. You can run simulators faster than real time. And it's scalable, right? So you can have a simulation running on every core in your data center. You don't need to go and buy new robots. Uh, maybe more importantly, it's safe. Right? So you can't actually um, damage something by running a simulation, um, at least not yet. Um, you get labels for free, because you design the world, so you know where all the objects are, and you know um, kind of how the task is evolving. And you're not beholden to real world probability distributions. And I'll expand on what I mean by this in a second. Um, but first, labeling. I think this is kind of like an underrated advantage of simulation. Um, there are a lot of tasks where it's very hard to get a human to label the data for you. So for example, if um, you have images from the real world and you want to have someone annotate the ground truth for depth in those images, that's kind of like a hard task for, for a human to do. Um, or similarly, annotating the 3D pose of objects when you only have a 2D image. Both of those things, you know, it's kind of hard to just go and um, ask people on Amazon Turk to do it for you. What do I mean by not being beholden to real world probability distributions? A um, couple of kind of examples I want to mention here. Um, first is the edge case problem. So if you're training a self-driving car, right, most of the time your car is just driving on the highway. But every once in a while, you see something like this, right, like a unicyclist in a pink uh, <laughs> bodysuit, or you know, a kangaroo hopping across the road. Maybe that's common in Australia. I don't know, but definitely not here. Um, or this like crazy roundabout that's like five roundabouts in one or something like that. Um, and so you know, the, the challenge with edge cases in self-driving cars is that, by definition, we have sort of very few, if any, training examples for our robot. And so how do we, like, if we're doing machine learning, how do we not overfit to the training examples that we have? Um, and if we can train on simulated data, that might be a way around that. Another reason I'm excited about simulation is for reducing bias. Um, so you know, take a toy example here. Like, let's say that we're training a model to distinguish, um, I don't know, dogs from puppies. And uh, our training data looks like this. 
right? Um, so this training data is biased because um, it only has golden retrievers in the dogs category. And so what would happen if we train a model on data that looks like this? Well, the model might classify all Australian shepherds as puppies, right? And that's really bad because there are adult Australian shepherds as well. And so you know, the question I have is, can we fix this by synthesizing adult Australian shepherds? But I think kind of the core question to, to ask yourself about all this is, like, if simulation works, it could be really valu valuable. But what reason do we have to believe that it should actually work? Um, and so this is a quote from Rodney Brooks that I like, because I think it captures what the way that most people in the robotics community and the machine learning community felt for a long time about the value of simulation. Right? Um, there is actually a near certainty that programs that work well um, on our simulated robots will completely fail in the real world. And the reason that they'll fail is because you know, in the, real, the real world is not like simulation. There are differences between, um, between the di dynamics in the real world and those in our simulator. OK, so what am I going to talk about for, for the rest of this talk? Um, the first thing I want to touch on is just I want to give you sort of an intuitive sense of why it's so hard to use simulated training data. So you know, why is it the case that we have a gap between simulation and the real world? Um, and then I want to sort of briefly mention um, you know, simulation is a broad topic in robotics. And there are, even if you don't solve the sim to real problem, you can still use simulation um, to help you build robot systems that work. And so I'll talk about a couple of those. Um, then I'll mention kind of some ways that you can go about building a good simulation. So a simulation that's a good fit for the real world. And then I'll talk about a couple of techniques to bridge the gap. So the first is domain adaptation. And then the second is domain randomization, which I'll have the most to say about. And then finally, I want to mention um, a couple of thoughts about sort of what's next for this field of sim to real. Um, but are there any questions before I dive into that? All right. So why is it so hard to use simulated training data? Um, I think the core, um, at its core, there are two reasons. The first is that it's really hard to accurately and also efficiently model sensors and physical systems. And then the second is that even if you have only like a small modeling error, that can tend to lead to large errors in the behavior of the downstream control system. Um, so why is it hard to accurately and efficiently model sensors and physical systems? Well, you know, as you talked about a couple of weeks ago, um, physics simulators make some big assumptions about the world in order to run faster. Right? So a lot of physics simulators assume that all the objects are convex, um, or that we have sort of di discrete time steps with a relatively large um, uh, DT, or that all bodies are rigid, um, or we have a simplified model of friction, let's say. Um, and so there's, there's inherently going to be gaps between any model that makes assumptions this large and the physics of the real world. Um, but also, you know, even if you can model everything accurately, then um, uh, if you want to carefully match the real world, you still need to get the parameters of that simulation right. And so how do you measure things that are not d directly observable in your data, like damping, inertia, and friction? And you know, the more accurate your model um, is, the more parameters it's going to have. And so the more of these things you need to measure. Um, and so that means that you need more data in order to accurately estimate them. I'll talk a little bit more on how to, how to do this later. But it's not just physics. Um, you know, we can do a reasonably good job now of uh, photorealistic rendering of sensors. And so this is an example from a movie a few years ago, uh, ago, which is the remake of The Jungle Book. And I think this is a really good example of super, super high quality rendered images. But if you look at how much effort went into creating images like this, it's like tens of hours of artist effort per frame. Right? So getting uh, sensor data that's this high quality is very expensive. And it's really not a solved problem. right? And um, so I think LiDAR is kind of one example of um, something that people see as, um, as being relatively easy to simulate. But in fact, there are, there are a lot of gaps between how LiDAR simulators work and um, real world LiDAR data. OK, so there's, so, um, there's always going to be some sort of gap between your simulator and the data that you get from the real world. But what's worse is that you know, if there is a gap, then, um, then simulators will tend, or then uh, your model will tend to exploit it. Right? So um, one reason for that is that like, one of my intuitions about neural networks is that they're very lazy. Right? And so if there's like, some artifact in your data distribution that they can exploit, they will exploit it. Um, and so an example to illustrate this point is the virtual kitty data set. And so, they essentially um, took 
each scene in a self-driving car data set and exhaustively reproduced it in simulation. And they trained a model on both the real data distribution and the simulated data distribution. And so even though this is kind of like the best that you could expect to do in terms of recreating your real data distribution, there's still a big gap in the performance between training on the simulated version and the real version. Um, but so you might say, well, maybe it's OK if we have some errors, because um, our, our, our robot should be robust to errors that we make in, in modeling, right? Um, I think one challenge is that errors tend to compound for, um, uh, for gaps between sim and real. And so what we hope happens is you know, if you have some blue curve that's like the path that you want the robot to follow, and um, the green curve is the path that it actually follows, where you kind of make um, small mistakes along the way, but those mistakes are uncorrelated, and so you're able to kind of keep the robot on track. Um, but what actually happens a lot in the real world is that you have um, you know, the same path that you're trying to follow, but the robot gets off the path. And it gets so far off the path that it's um, out of the data distribution that it's trained on, and it's not able to recover. All right, um, any, any questions about what I've covered so far? All right, um, the next thing I want to talk about is, like, so we've, we've sort of established that this, this sim to real problem, like the problem of using simulated data for real world tasks is hard. So the next thing I want to address is like, why, why should we do this at all? Maybe we can take advantage of simulation um, without needing to train robots on it. And there's a couple of ways that you can do that. Um, one is, you know, simulation is great for prototyping your algorithms. Um, simulation is also really good for debugging your specific implementation and making sure that, you know, you have sort of bug-free code before running it on a robot. Um, prototyping entire systems, and then testing. Um, so for prototyping algorithms, I think this is like really common in reinforcement learning, for example, where people will, if they're trying to come up with a better reinforcement learning algorithm, they'll you know, almost always run that in simulation before it ever makes it to a real robot. And you know, the reason for that is you wanna, you're, you're going to have to do a lot of cycles, and so you want to make sure you're using those cycles efficiently. Um, it's also useful for debugging your software. And so typically this is done in um, tools like Gazebo and ROS that are very similar to the software that's actually going to be running on the robot. And so what you do here is you actually implement your entire stack that you want to run on your robot. And then you make sure that it, um, with realistic latency and uh, all the sort of bugs in your raw stack, that you're able to get things to work in simulation first before deploy deploying them on the robot. Another use case that you see a lot in industrial robotics is for prototyping entire systems, right? So, um, you know, for example, like if you have some task that you want your industrial robot to solve, then you need to figure out what robot you're going to use, and you need to once you figure that out, you want to like kind of make sure that it's going to be able to solve the task before you go and buy it and like invest the effort into installing it. And then you often need to design the entire cell itself, so like the entire workflow that the robot is going to be part of. And uh, you can prototype things like that much faster in simulation. And then finally, you can kind of um, test how long things are going to take and make some sort of ROI calculation before you decide to invest in expensive robots. One other um, kind of use case that I'm actually really excited about that I want to mention is um, for reliability testing and or like continuous integration for robotic software development. Um, and so, you know, I think the question is like, say you're developing a self-driving car. Um, and you make some change to your, to your vision model, right? And so how do you make sure that that change to your vision model um, is not actually going to degrade performance in the real world? So the most straightforward way to do that is you can run tests against your log data. So you can like, look at all the sensor data that your robot has seen before, and then you can look at your model against that and make sure that the errors it makes aren't too big. But the challenges are that like, log data is itself incomplete, right? It's, it's a noisy observation of the world. You don't have full state information. Um, and you know, it's partially observed. And then importantly, like log data is also static, right? So really what you want to do is you want to make sure that your, your entire control system still behaves well when you make a change to your vision system. But if you're looking at log data, then um, you, know, uh, you, you, can't, like, you can't explore what happens when your robot's behavior itself changes. You can only look at sort of what's happening in the current time step. Um, and so a lot of self-driving car companies have invested pretty heavily in this. Um, there's an article that came out about Waymo's um, simulation testing setup that I recommend checking out. And um, you know, they've, they've run like several, several more ad, uh, orders of magnitude 
of tests in simulation than they have on real cars. Another example of this that I really like is the approach that um, Russ Tedrick's group is taking um, at Toyota Research Institute. And so they call it simulation first robotic development. And basically what this means is that they have a bunch of tests that run in simulation every night. And um, so they want to make sure that like any changes to the code base that they push during the day, um, they want to know how those affect the behavior of the robot in the simulation. And so the keys that, um, that they've mentioned that have been important for this technique being successful are making sure that the simulation is harder than the real environment that they're trying to solve, um, being rigorous about sources of randomness. So you know, knowing that if you're, you have a degradation in performance, it's not just because you got unlucky with um, the random seed. Um, and then manually going through the errors that your model makes to find kind of sources of bugs. So like looking, you know, if you if you if you had a degradation in performance overnight, then like actually going and looking at each of those cases and saying like, okay, why did we make this mistake? And then um, lastly, good contact simulation is important for them. Okay. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is like if like let's say that we decide to use simulation um, to train our our robots or just to do testing, then how can we actually go about building a good simulation? Um, but I'll, I'll pause there just to see if there were any questions on the past section. Yeah, um, maybe toss the, all right. Um, so my question is, do you know if most self-driving car companies just use simulation for testing, or do they also train on that data? Yeah, I think um, self-driving car companies are sort of interested and curious about training on self-driving car data, but, um, and I, I think it, so from the ones that I've talked to, they, I, they have tried doing this, but I don't think it's a widespread practice right now. Uh, you quoted earlier about like, make simulation harder than reality. Can you yeah. maybe like, expand on that? How can you actually make simulation like a more rigorous than reality? That sounds a little bit like counterintuitive. Sure, yeah, um, it's, a, it's a good question. So. The, um, so like one way to think about it is, let's say that you're, um, you're training a robot that you want to be able to um, grasp objects, right? And so you have some properties that you know about the objects that you want to be able to grasp. Like maybe they're all, they're all objects that you'd see in a kitchen. And they're all between this size and this size. And um, you know, it's always going to be, well, uh, the, like lighting conditions are always going to be good when you're trying to grasp the robots. Um, one thing that you might think about when designing the simulator is, like take your worst case estimate of all of those things and um, just make sure that your simulator is like sort of biased towards that. So make sure that you're giving the robot lots of the hardest objects um, for it to grasp in the simulation rather than, you know, like if, if you only see those hard objects 1% of the time in the real world, maybe you um, see it more of the time in, in the simulated world. All right. Um, so I think the process that people typically go through when they're designing a simulator is, you know, first you kind of build the model of the world, um, and then you create scenarios. Um, so the, the first part is about like designing the physics and making sure that you have accurate um, uh, kind of model of your robot. And then the second part is about um, creating the scenarios that the robot is going to interact with. So like um, which roads is it going to need to drive on, or which objects is it going to need to pick up. And then finally. Um, Typically, what you'll do is you'll collect a bunch of data from the real world. And you'll use that data to um, do system ID, which is a process of improving your simulation. So just really briefly on designing the simulation model, um, I'll just refer you back to Peter's lecture earlier in this class. Um, in practice, what most people do is they don't build their simulator from scratch. They just pick Bullet or PyBullet um, or Mujoko, and then use the models that are provided uh, for them by the developer of their robot. A couple of other simulators that are worth looking at. Um, uh, Drake from Russ Tedrake's group, again, at MIT, um, which is, I think, pushing a little bit more towards trying to make more realistic simulation at the expense of it being uh, maybe a little bit slower. And then Gazebo, which was the most, popular simulator, the most popular simulator for a while in robotics and has since fallen out of favor. But if you're doing a lot of stuff with Ross, it's still worth exploring. The next thing you need to do is create your scenarios for the robot. Um, and so this is kind of the process of like designing the world that the robot is going to interact with. 
Um, and so I think kind of one of the main questions here is, like, where do we actually get 3D models for things? Right? So if the robot needs to interact with objects, where do we find examples of objects that the robot can interact with in the simulator? Um, there's a spectrum of different options that sort of have trade-offs in terms of the quality of the objects and the number of objects. Um, ShapeNet is the one that's freely available that I think has the most objects, and so it's like in the high tens of thousands. But the quality of the objects themselves tends to vary. Um, YCB is sort of at the other end of the spectrum. Very, very high quality um, object models, but not very many of them. Um, DexNet is a data set from, um, from, uh, from Jeff Mahler at Berkeley. And it's actually a combination of other data sets. And this is, I think, at a good, pretty good trade-off point between quality of the models themselves and the number of models that you have access to. Um, a couple of other things to be aware of. There are like all these sort of 3D model repositories that you might see if you've ever done like game development. Um, these are worth checking out. Generally, you can't get things for free from them. Um, and then lastly, procedural object generation. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Um, and so then you know, the next question is like, we have our database of objects that we want the robot to be able to interact with, like many hammers and cups and whatever it is that we need our robot to do. And so then the next question is like, how do we place those into the world in a coherent way? Um, you could just try placing them randomly, but what tends to happen if you do that is that all the objects will sort of collide with each other and they'll be in very unrealistic configurations. Um, you can place them randomly according to physics. So maybe you just have like a, a, a box that the objects are sitting in and you might drop them from above the box before the scene starts so that they're, so that they're at least placed in a way that's consistent with physics. Or you might do it procedurally. Um, so I mentioned procedural content generation in the context of object modeling and also world design. Um, and so this is kind of a pretty big and well explored area in game design. Um, I, I won't really go into it, but um, there's a book that I recommend if you want to learn more about that topic. All right, and so lastly, um, you have, uh, you know, you've built your simulator, you have collected a bunch of scenarios that you can put in your simulator that you want your robot to per perform well on. And so then the next thing to do is like, um, you've made guesses at all of your physics parameters when you've been modeling, modeling the world. And so the next thing you want to do is like, Actually, actually collect a bunch of data and use that data to try to make the simulator a better match for reality. Um, and so this is the process of system ID. So what is the problem that we're trying to solve with system ID? Well, we have some like parameters, parameters of our simulation. So these are things like friction, um, damping, you know, um, mass of different links of the robot. And then we have some sequence of actions that we want the robot to follow. Um, and so the goal of system ID is to try to find the set of parameter values that give you the um, sort of lowest loss, um, the lowest difference between what the robot does when you execute, execute those actions in the simulator and what it does when you execute those actions in reality. All right, so there are a few design choices here. Um, one is, like, how do you actually choose this sequence of actions? So like, what do you want to actually run on the robot in order to uh, like, in order to kind of minimize the difference between sim and real, and then another is like, what distance function do you want to use? So how do you tell if um, how do you measure if these two trajectories are close to one another? Um, and so I'm going to just give a quick sort of case study of how this worked for one problem, um, which was um, uh, doing system ID for the shadow hand in some of the OpenAI robotics experiments. Um, so in this case. They chose trajectories that consisted of kind of individually moving each joint to its limits, um, and then moving each finger individually um, along like kind of spline curves um, to try to capture the interdependencies between the joints. And then the distance function that they use is they took, you know, they applied the same sequence of actions both in sim and real, and then they looked at where the robot was one second later, and then they took the difference between those those states and. Um, tried to minimize that distance. And then finally, the optimization algorithm that they used to do this minima minimization was um, sort of iterating between the coordinates and doing coordinate descent until things converged. OK, so you've, you know, you've designed your simulator, and you've tried to make it as good a fit to reality as you can. Um, but you know, as I alluded to earlier, there's still going to be gaps. Right? So your simulator is still not really going to be a perfect match for reality. And so kind of the rest of the talk is about what to do about that.
but before I dive into that, yeah, there's a question here. Um, have you ever seen a simulator that has good like other agents as well, like simulation of like other cars in the scene or maybe things that the robot is going to interact with? Yeah, it's a it's a really good question. Um, I think so. A couple of ways that I've seen people do deal with this. One is um, if you're if you can incorporate the learning of the other agent into the actual optimization process. So if you're in like a multi-agent reinforcement learning setting, um, that's kind of one way that people deal with this. But in general, this is a really hard problem. And this is like when you talk to self-driving car companies about their problems with simulation, one of the biggest ones that they cite is not having good models of like how pedestrians are going to behave or how other drivers are going to behave. Um, and so I think you know. If you can figure out an answer to that question, then it's going to be really, really valuable in that industry. Yeah. Um, for the data collection in the previous slide, how about um, running an optimization also over the data collection? Hmm. So you're saying um, also figuring out, trying to optimize which data set to collect in order to minimize. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, I've I'm sure that there are examples of people doing that. I've not seen people try it myself. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have a sense for which types of tasks it's possible to make a good simulation for and which types of tasks is just like near impossible? Hmm. Um, So I'll give a couple of categories of things that are maybe harder to make a simulation for. Um, I think anything where it's um, so anything where it like explicitly violates the assumptions that most simulators make. So if you have non-rigid bodies, like if you need to do cloth simulation, for example, um, you can do that, but it's it tends to be harder. Um, so that's kind of one category of things. Like maybe if your robot needs to interact with fluids, that might also be really difficult. Um, and then another category of things is just where you have um, where the like set of things that you need your robot to be able to solve is just really wide. So if, for example, you're trying to make a simulator for all of self-driving cars, then it's like, how can you possibly get enough variety in your simulator to um, capture all of the different scenarios that you might see in a self-driving car? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, how do you think about well, it's, it's for the recording, I think. Yeah. yeah. Um, how do you think about like the model class that you should have here? For example, like you could you can imagine using a neural network, but like in between all the data points that you observe, it's arbitrarily bad. So how do you how do you what is your process for selecting the appropriate model for for, for the dynamics for the dynamics yeah. itself? Um, yeah, I think I think typically the thing that you want to do is like. So neural networks can like basically learn any function, right? Um, or they can learn any function if you have enough data. But um, the challenge with neural nets is that they don't really generalize that well um, to data, data that's out of the distribution that they've seen before. And so I think like one of the reasons why simulated tr uh, training data works so well is because we like we as humans actually know things about the world, right? Um, it's not like the world is just a black box that spits data out at us. Like we understand um, at least. At a, at a simplified level, how physics work, um, and so I think like one of the one of the reasons why this approach has actually been really successful is because um, if you build a physics model of the world um, and then use that to generate data, then even if it's not perfect, we're exploiting some of our knowledge about how the real world works. Um, so I, I guess my answer is um, I would I would suggest like trying to use like physically based models and. Um, yeah, and I think uh, Peter's lecture on that from a couple weeks ago is a, is a good starting point for that. All right. Um, so addressing the gap between the simulator and the real world. Um, the first class of techniques that I want to talk about is domain adaptation. Um, so this is sort of a broad topic in machine learning, and I don't really have time to do it justice. But what I do want to do is just give a few examples of how domain adaptation techniques have been applied for sim to real problems in robotics. Um, and so I would kind of categorize domain adaptation techniques into two buckets. One is supervised domain adaptation, where you know, like, let's say that you assume that you're able to get labels or reward signal in the real world. And then the other is 
unsupervised or weakly supervised domain adaptation, where um, you know, your assumption is that we have labels and rewards in the simulator, but in the real world, we don't. We just have like only unlabeled sensor data. Um, so the first category is supervised domain adaptation. And so you know, for those of you that have, um, that have done like, that have trained like convolutional neural networks, for example, um, the simplest form of supervised domain adaptation is just fine tuning, right? So you train on some source data distribution and then you kind of um, take the weights that you get from training on that source data distribution and then you just retrain them a little bit on data from your target data distribution. So from the real world in this example. Um, and so this, this can work quite well in robotics and it's present in a lot of papers but it's kind of rarely the focus of, of people's effort when they're doing research in this area. Um, one kind of extension of, of fine tuning is this idea of progressive networks. And so um, you know, one of the challenges with fine tuning is that when you fine tune a model that's trained on one data set to another data set, it tends to forget what it learned in the first data set. And so progressive networks are kind of a way to try to address that, where instead of fine tuning the same network, they instead like, add some additional layers to the network, and then those are what they train on the second data set. Another approach that people have tried here is um, what I would call like learning inverse dynamics. And so inverse dynamics is basically you, um, you have kind of the current state of the world, and then you have some goal state that you want to get to. And the, the learning problem that you're trying to solve is learning what action will take you from, uh, from this state to the next state. Um, and so there's a couple of different variations of this technique that people have tried. Another idea in this category is using simulation to find a low dimensional search space. Um, so one thing that you can do is like, you know, one of the reasons why it's slow to learn policies or models in the real world is because you're searching over this really high dimensional space, which is like all possible policies. But if you train in simulation and you use that to find like a sub manifold of, um, of that huge space and then search over that in the real world, then that could make learning more efficient. And then the final category that I want to just quickly mention here is using simulation um, explicitly as a Bayesian prior for, um, for your learning in the real world. And you know, there's, there's uh, quite a bit of research in this area. And um, I think this category is actually particularly exciting for, um, for kind of ongoing research. Yes? Could you expand on the learn inverse dynamics? Yeah. Um, so the idea in this category of, um, of techniques is like, so you train a model in simulation, and the goal of that model in simulation is to tell the robot what states it's trying to reach at any given time point. Um, and so th that model might say like, um, all right, here is a trajectory that I, you know, given the state of the world that I see now, here's the trajectory that I want to follow. Um, but you know, the challenge is that if you, um, if you just apply the actions that you took in the simulator, then that won't actually allow you to follow the same trajectory in the real world. Um, and so what you're doing here is you're kind of like, um, you're, you're taking the output of that simulated model, which says like, all right, since I'm in this state, I need to go to this state next. And then what you're learning on real data is the function that allows you to get from this state to the next state. Other questions on this? All right, so there's also um, kind of less supervised domain adaptation. Um, one ca category is weakly supervised, where you take, um, you know, you take the, the labels of, that your model outputs um, and you treat them as kind of, uh, or you, you, treat, you take your model's predictions and you treat those as noisy labels um, for fine tuning. There's self-supervised domain adaptation. So if you can create a system that allows the robot to do things that automatically allow it to label the data. So if you know that, um, for example, that if you kind of, um, uh, that if, like, if you have a sensor that tells you that this object has moved, then that might tell you, well, okay, if, if the object has moved above a certain height, then that means that our, that our attempt to grasp that object was successful. So that's kind of this category of things. Um, and then lastly is unsupervised domain adaptation. And um, so I think kind of the most exciting recent in advance in this is um, taking image to image translation models and applying those to domain adaptation. And so what I mean by that is you might have um, some data from your simulator that's unrealistic. And then you might also have some data from the real world, but the data from the real world doesn't have labels. And so what you can do is you can uh, learn a function that maps your simulated data 
into the real world and tries to match the data distribution from the real world. And so the idea is like you're kind of translating the image from the simulated domain into the real domain. Um, and if you can do that successfully, then what that allows you to do is take your, uh, is to train on data that's instead of just your simulated data, it's the translated data. Um, so you can train on data that looks like this. And then the hope is that when you go to the real world, um, the, it's close enough that, that things will be successful. All right, any questions about domain adaptation? That was kind of like a quick tour. Um, it's a very deep topic, but um, I, I have to move on to other things. All right. Um, the next topic I want to talk about is um, domain randomization. And so the idea here is, you know, in a lot of, in sort of the techniques that we've talked about so far for sim to real transfer, the assumption has been, like, let's try to model the, the real world as closely as we can in the simulator. And if we get it close enough, then like maybe that data will be more useful um, in the real world. Or maybe at least that will, it will allow us to kind of adapt between that data and the real world data. Um, but the idea of domain randomization is a little bit different, which is um, instead of trying to find a single best simulator, let's just make the simulator as varied as possible. And you know, maybe um, the hypothesis is that like, maybe if the, if the model sees enough simulated variation, so it sees enough kind of different simulated worlds, then when it does get into the real world, it'll have learned sort of a general enough strategy um, because it's seen so much variety that it'll be able to figure out what's happening in the real world. Um, so this is kind of the core idea. And um, what I want to cover on domain randomization, um, first I want to give like kind of a little bit of a history of the idea, because I think it's, it's important to kind of know um, where this idea came from and it's not a new idea. Um, then I want to talk about some of the applications that people have used it for. Um, then I want to try to give you a little bit of an intuition as to why it works, right? Because it's kind of a counterintuitive thing, right? Why should training on a lot of really unrealistic data allow us to generalize to realistic data? Then I want to brief, briefly mention a few tools if you want to use this in practice that you can, um, that you can go try. And then finally, I want to talk about um, some extensions that people have made to this core idea um, and sort of how this research field is evolving. All right, starting with the history. Um, I think, you know, so, so again, this is like the, this idea of using really noisy simulators is not new in robotics. And the first instance that I know of is from this paper called um, the radical envelope of noise hypothesis from 1997. And the idea here is if you're trying to solve a task, like you, know, you have a robot driving down a hallway, and it needs to turn, decide whether to turn left or right, depending on whether it gets a flash of light from the left or the right, how do you build a simulator to solve this task? Well, um, the, the insight of this paper was to say, there's you know, some things that we really need to model carefully in order to actually solve the problem at all. And so that's, um, that's what we would call like, the, the base set of things in the simulator, right? So is the light coming from the left or is it coming from the right? Um, how long is the hallway and things like that? And then there's a bunch of other things that, that we need to model in our simulator but that are sort of inconsequential for solving the task. So like, um, you know, what is, the, what is the friction model between the wheels and the hallway? Um, and so the, the insight here is we want to take the base set and model those things um, as carefully as possible and then take everything else and maximally randomize it. And they were able to solve um, this task using sort of a very simple simulator by using this technique. In the deep learning world, the first example of this that I've seen is from this like, very underrated paper called Live Repetition Counting. Um, and the idea of this paper is you know, they wanted to train um, a model that could count when people are doing cyclical behavior. So when they're doing push-ups or jumping jacks or something like that. Um, but they didn't really want to like, like, go through all the effort of labeling data of people doing that. So what they did instead is they created this synthetic training data set that consisted of kind of um, random white noise in the background and then cyclical periodic noise in the foreground. And the really surprising result from this paper was that when they trained the model on um, data that looked like this random noise and then tested it on real data, they were able to actually solve the task, right? They were able to count how many times people were doing jumping jacks. The first application of this sort of concept in robotics, um, in sort of deep learning in robotics that I'm aware of is 
um, this paper called CAD 2 RL um, from Sergey Levin's group here at Berkeley. And um, the, the task that they were trying to solve here is uh, driving a quadcopter down a hallway and making sure that it doesn't hit the walls. And so they built this simulator that, had, um, that was randomized with these different sort of semi-realistic textures and floor plans that they, um, that they designed. And what they found was that when they trained on this simulator, they were able to fly a quadcopter down a real hallway and not crash, at least um, reasonably frequently. And then I think you know, um, the last two papers that I mentioned were kind of the inspiration for, um, for us to start working on this. And the, the core thing that we wanted to try to figure out is whether we could apply this idea to sort of more precise tasks in robotics, so to grasping something where you need to be able to position the gripper really carefully. Um, and we were also curious to see whether, um, you know, whether we could get away without needing to design um, floor plans and textures ourselves if instead we could just procedurally generate those in a really un unrealistic way. Um, and then finally, we were curious if we really needed to pre-train these models on ImageNet in order for this to work, or whether we could just train them only on synthetic data. All right, so next thing I'm going to talk about is some of the ways that people have applied this idea. And the first is kind of the problem that I just mentioned, which is using domain randomization for computer vision, and in particular, using, for using it to estimate the pose of a, of a particular object in a scene. Um, and so what we did here is we, for each scene, so for each like, image that the, the model saw, we um, gave it a unique set of randomization. So we randomized things like textures and materials, um, colors of the background, um, and things like that. We changed the positions of the cameras, we changed the lighting, and we added a bunch of other objects to the scene that were sort of trying to distract the model from the object that it ultimately cares about. We trained a relatively simple neural network, so this is kind of just a, a VGG with the top two fully connected layers popped off and um, smaller ones put on top. And the model is taking an image of a scene and regressing it to just the x, y, and z coordinates of a particular object that we care about in that scene. So how well does it work? Um, you know, this is sort of an unfair comparison because you know, all, all of these papers use different objects and different distances from the camera and so on. But kind of at a high level, we're sort of within what you'd expect to be able to do with relatively state-of-the-art um, pose estimation techniques from a single, singular, uh, single monocular camera training entirely on synthetic data. And so here's what this work looks like when you deploy it on a robot to grasp an object. Maybe. Hmm. All right, well, we'll see if we can get the other ones to work then. I saw it do something. Oh, there we go. OK, yeah, so this is um, kind of an, extent, an extension of the original paper where we were, uh, you know, it was April Fool's Day, and we wanted to like, um, see if we could train a robot that could detect like, spam in the real world. So we, we, uh, we built a spam detecting robot, and it would pick up the, the spam off the table and drop it in the trash can. Um, the, other, the next thing that we applied this to at OpenAI was block stacking. Um, and so the goal here was we um, had trained a policy that could do block stacking in simulation using um, one-shot imitation learning. Right? So um, see a single demonstration of a human doing the task in virtual reality, and then apply it from different initial conditions. Um, but the challenge was, in order to deploy this in the real world, we needed to know where the blocks were. Um, and so we, we trained a um, similar model, really similar data set, and um, we were much more careful about sort of uh, calibrating cameras and stuff like that. And we were able to get really precise localizations of the objects um, so that you could actually stack six blocks on top of each other using um, you know, vision models trained entirely on synthetic data. So how does it work? Um, a few observations. One is, you know, one of the really important things is just using a lot of data. Um, so as you increase the number, the amount of training data um, on the x-axis, then 
the, the error goes down, at least until you get to around 50 or 100,000 images. Um, you might ask, like, what's, what's the important part of having more data? Is it just having more training examples? Um, uh, so we tested whether we could get the same results with the same number of images, but with fewer unique textures. And it turns out that um, the important thing here was you need to have um, as many unique textures as you can. So as, if, um, as you increase the number of unique textures, the error also goes down. And then lastly, and this is kind of surprising to us, um, was that to find that you know, pre-training our model on ImageNet is actually not necessary. And um, so you can see like, pre-training ImageNet actually does help. right? Like If you are in the low data regime, then the model pre-trained on ImageNet is still able to do something reasonable. But as you get enough data, then, um, then pre-training becomes unnecessary. All right, so here, here's just a few other um, kind of highlights of results that people have had using um, using this technique or extensions of this technique to solve other kind of um, uh, perception problems in robotics. So people have extended it to estimating, you know, not just where the object is on the table, but the full sort of 6D pose, so the position and orientation of the object. Um, people have extended it to uh, doing objects with really challenging textures, and so this is a paper where they used domain randomization to train a model, uh, perception model for a system that was grasping fish out of a bucket. Um, not sure why they picked that task, but it's, it's a really challenging one for, from a perception standpoint because fish are like kind of shiny and reflective and, um, and difficult to model those textures. And then people have also extended to, you know, instead of just localizing where a single object is with a single network, instead localizing um, kind of an entire corpus of objects. A few others I want to highlight. Um, people have used these techniques for object detection for autonomous vehicles, um, for face tracking, so taking a simulated model of your face, randomizing it, um, training a model on that to sort of tell the pose of your face from a single camera image, localizing a robot within a lung. Um, so you know, you're, you're, if, you have, like, if you're driving a robot around a lung and you want to decide whether to turn left or turn right, you need to know where in the lung you are. And so if you have a vision model that allows you to uh, sort of take the, the image that, you, that the robot sees and then map it back to where on the map of the lung you are. Um, sort of end-to-end -end control. So instead of just training a pose estimator, you can also train a policy that takes images directly and outputs um, commands to the robot. And so people have, people have done that with domain randomized data. And then also cloth manipulation. Um, so estimating kind of the state of a cloth so that a robot can fold the corners together. Um, so also you know, tasks where there's non-rigid objects. This technique also works for other types of sensors. So um, uh, some of uh, Jeff Mahler's work here at Berkeley on DexNet, which is a um, sort of work that um, does a really good job of grasping generic objects. Um, their, their models are trained. The inputs to their models are images from, um, at least in this version of the work, or images from a depth camera. And you can apply a similar set of techniques by like, a adding a lot of random noise to the depth image. And then you can train on synthetic de depth images and generalize to real depth images in the real world. A couple of assumptions that um, the results I've shown you so far have in common. The first is that you actually have um, 3D models of kind of all the objects that you want to track. And so you know, one thing that you might ask is, how can, we, how can we move from this, right? So how can we move from needing 3D models of every object that we care about to being able to train a sort of generic vision policy that can work for any type of object? And so we explore this um, in the context of grasping, right? So you know, in grasping, like, you care about be really being able to grasp any object. But um, as we talked about earlier, it's really hard to get good databases of objects to train your model on. And so we asked the question, well, maybe you know, similarly to how you don't really need realistic textures in order to train a, a vision model, maybe you also don't need realistic objects to train a grasping model. Um, and so we procedurally generated these sort of highly unrealistic Im um, objects, like on the left, and we trained a policy to pick up those objects in simulation um, based, on, uh, you know, based on depth images of the objects. And then we tested on real world objects. And kind of the, the surprising thing that we found out was that we're able to 
um, actually generalize to grasping realistic objects in the real world from only training on highly unrealistic procedurally generated objects entirely in simulation. This is what it looks like. Um, so again, it's not perfect, right? This is not, we're not getting 100% success here. Um, but it's, you know, it's a gra generalized grasping is a very difficult problem. And the, the interesting result here is that we're able to get something to work at all using entirely simulated data. Another assumption baked into the results I've shown you so far is that sort of dynamics are relatively consistent between the simulator and the real world. Um, so what if, what if that's not true, right? So what if you're, um, what if, you know, what if there's some gap in physics between your simulator and the real world? Um, and so similar set of ideas also applies to randomizing dynamics. Um, so the way this typically works is, you know, in standard reinforcement learning, you'll train like a feed-forward neural network policy on a single best version of the environment. And then you'll um, execute that on your test environment. But what these techniques do is instead they train a recurrent neural network. So a neural network that has some state um, and they'll train that on a variety of different physical uh, of physics environments. And the idea here is that the, the memory of the neural network, um, in principle, should allow the neural network to kind of figure out which version of the simulation it's in and adapt to that simulation. So the first set of results here um, was from uh, Jason Peng during his internship at OpenAI. And they worked on kind of these um, tasks that involved sort of sliding objects on a table. And so this is trained entirely in simulation with a, um, uh, with a recurrent neural network and, um, and then generalizes to the real world. This has also been extended to more challenging tasks. Um, so this is a result from OpenAI about a little more than a year ago where they, um, we trained a, um, a robotic hand, a high dimensional robotic hand, to sort of reorient it and manipulate objects in hand. So it's a very like, contact rich and challenging task. And um, this is trained you know, more or less exactly the same way using randomized physics parameter parameters. Um, in a little bit more detail, you know, the way this worked is there were a bunch of different sort of variations of the environment and um, robots were trained in those environments using reinforcement learning. Um, and there were the, the recurrent policies were forced to adapt to a wide range of different physics environments. And then in the real world, there was also a um, sort of a state estimation module that was trained in a similar way. So trained on vision data from the simulator and then deployed, um, deployed in order to like estimate the state so that the policy could know what to do next. And so the things that um, are typically randomized here or, and that were randomized in this paper are things like physical parameters, um, but then also just sort of correlated and uncorrelated noise being added to the simulation, um, sensor dropout. So occasionally just um, assuming that the sensor fails, um, how long the, the physics, time, how long DT is in the physics simulation. Um, there's a model of backlash that's applied to it and there are random forces that are applied to the object as well. So there's like quite a bit of effort that went into figuring out what are really all the things that we need to randomize in order to make something like this transfer. All right, any, any questions about kind of like the high level idea here, um, sort of where people have applied it to, where it works, where it doesn't, before I move on to talking about my intuition about why this actually works? Yeah. Cube is behind you. So when you see sim to real not working, how can you tell what the failure mode was? Like, was it the dynamics that was different? Was it the pose estimation that was different? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And I think this is sort of one of the core things that makes, uh, that's, makes using these techniques still difficult. Um, there's a few things that you can do to make it easier. Um, I think in a lot of the OpenAI results, the sort of approach that we took was to separate perception and control. So we'll have one neural network that's um, looking at raw sensor data like images and then it's trying to output what it thinks the state of the world is given those images. And then we'll have another module that says, all right, given that I know the state of the world, um, let me try to predict what I should do next. And so separating those two things allows you to audit it a little bit more easily. 
um, because then you can look at the, the errors that the pose estimation module, like the state estimator, is doing specifically um, and isolate that as a source of error. But in general, like if you, you know, if you're if you're deploying a model to the real world and it, um, you know, and it and it fails, right? It's like it's still a very hard problem to go back and see, like, okay, what, like, did this fail because, you know, um, there was there's like way more friction in this scenario than we modeled, or you know, is it something else? And so I think there's kind of a lot of like intuition and um, and engineering that goes into this still. I also have one more question. Yeah. So, how much? domain knowledge is required um, when you're applying these techniques to one robot versus then trying it for maybe a slightly different application. Is there a lot of fine tuning with each individual robot and each individual application or do you think you're getting closer to a general strategy? Yeah, it's, it's a little bit hard to answer that definitively because this has really only been tried on, to my knowledge, like a pretty small number of robots. Um, so there's the, the fetch robot that I showed you for the grasping examples and the, um, the shadow hand. Um, and I, I think there's, there's other examples too, but those are the two that I'm most fam familiar with. I think the thing that gives me hope that maybe it's, like maybe we're starting to figure out the limits of the parameters that we need to randomize and things like that is that um, the, the like OpenAI team was able to get the kind of the in-hand block manipulation um, result to work with other objects um, like different shaped objects with sort of relatively little additional effort on top of that. So that's kind of the one piece of evidence that I can point to that says, you know, maybe once we figure these things out once, it's easier to, to expand them to other types of problems. Question behind you. So if we're doing the um, physics parameter randomization, then can we skip the system ID stuff? Ah, great question. Um, in principle, you would hope, right, that like if we're randomizing physics, then the whole point is that like we're trying to make the our simulator so much more diverse than the real world that um, you know it doesn't matter that it's not exactly the same. Um, and I think for vision, that's mostly true. Like you don't really have to be super careful about calibrating things for for vision. Um, but for dynamics, that's decidedly not true. So it is it is still important. Like the better um, your system ID is. Um, the more likely this technique is to be successful for, for dynamics randomization, even if you're sort of have a big range of randomization parameters. And I'm not sure why that's the case. All right, so the next topic I want to touch on is like why, why does this work, right? It's kind of this mysterious thing. You have sort of all this varied training data and you train a model on it and then it kind of just magically works on your real data, even though the simulated data is super low fidelity and unrealistic. Um, so there's a few, uh, so I think no one really like has a great answer to this question. There's a few intuitions that I have that I wanna just sort of lay out for you. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about each of these. So the first intuition that I have is that, you know, maybe the training data itself comes from like some sort of covering distribution of the real world data. And so this intuition, intuition says that like, if you have an unrandomized simulator, maybe like this is sort of the distribution of um, kind of like environments and physics that you would see. But the real data is like this complicated, messy distribution of, um, of environments that's like much wider than your simulated distribution. And so that's why you don't generalize well if you use an unrandomized simulation. Um, and so what this intuition says is like, well, maybe what we can do is we can just make the range of um, randomizations so big in simulation that like everything that we might see in the real world like kind of lies somewhere in between different um, things that we've seen in ran when we're randomizing. And so like maybe the domain randomized data looks like this. It's like this massive um, ra distribution that covers the real distribution. Um, there's, so I think this is kind of a flawed intuition. I, there are a few things that I think are useful about it. Um, one is the idea that wider distribution, like, you know, the implication of this is that as you make the distribution of simulated parameters wider, you should get better results. And um, that tends to be true. Another thing that I think is useful about this is that th um, the concept that we've already touched on in the, in, the, um, in the sort of instance of testing, that you want your simulated task to be harder than your real task. And then um, I think the last intuition that this, uh, the last sort of, um, useful thing about this intuition is that it's clear from this intuition that if you want your model to perform well, then you need kind of um, you need to be able to perform well in all parts of this like massive distribution that you're training on, right? So it's not okay if like if 
you know, if your model performs really badly over here, right, because it might be the case that your real data sort of lies in that part of the region. Um, I think there are some problems with this in intuition. So we're mostly operating in high dimensional space. And so you know, we really should need a, like, a really massive amount of data to truly cover this real data distribution. And then um, you know, there are a lot of real world effects that we might not model at all in our simulator, um, like backlash, gear backlash, for example, or the specific distortion of the camera that you're using. And so if we're not modeling an effect at all, is it like, really reasonable to believe that the impact of that effect will somehow be accounted for by the things that we are randomizing. Um, another intuition that I think can be helpful in thinking about this is that domain randomization is a way of telling the model what it can ignore. Um, and so the, the example I have here is like, let's say that you have a data set that looks like this, and you train a neural network on it to predict whether the image comes from, label, from class one or class two. And so if you train on this data distribution, then what your model is going to do is it's going to train a detector for um, blue owls on green backgrounds. Right? So neural networks are kind of lazy, and they'll exploit any sort of commonality in the data that you give them. And so if you want to um, instead train an owl detector, then you need to, like, then what might work better is to, is to use data like this. Right? So um, if you don't want the model to pick up on the fact that all of the, the owls in your data set are blue, then maybe you should just change the color of the owl every single time so that you force that feature to be unreliable. And then the neural network can't exploit it in order to, decide, in order to make its decision. And then the last intuition I want to touch on is um, this idea of domain randomization as meta-learning. Um, so the, the high-level idea of meta-learning is that you know, in a standard machine learning task, you're trying to find some parameters that minimize um, some loss function on your data. But in meta-learning, you assume that you can also um, that you can also choose, uh, or, or that the, the data itself is, is not static, right? So you're minimizing some parameters um, for data that is sampled from some um, distribution over data sets. And so kind of a concrete example here is, like suppose that you're, um, you want to you train a model that can, from a very small number of images, distinguish between uh, two different classes, right? And so your training examples in this paradigm are themselves data sets. So you might have one data set that has cats and birds, and the model has to decide whether it's a cat or a bird. And then you might have another data set that has you know, flowers and bikes, and the model has to decide for a new image whether it's a flower or a bike. And then at test time, you'll be given some other data set that might have you know, some different classes, um, maybe that you haven't seen before. And then by ingesting this kind of small amount of labeled data, your model will need to uh, take a new image, like let's say of a dog, and then correctly predict whether it's a dog or an otter. Um, so this idea is, has been um, also applied to reinforcement learning. And, um, you know, and so like in this formulation, um, you have you know, the, the concept of a task. So like predicting whether something is a cat or a dog um, is like basically a, like one or more rollouts in a given environment. And then, um, you, kind of, and then you can kind of reset the state um, of the policy that you're using to learn um, between each of those tasks. Um, and so the, I think like the one paper that I like on this is RL squared paper from um, Rocky Duan, who was one of Peter's former PhD students. And um, the idea here is that like the recurrent neural network is allowed to use its hidden state within a given task to sort of quickly figure out how to solve a new reinforcement learning. And then there's a slow learning process on top of that that allows it to um, figure out what it needs to do when it's faced with a new environment in order to learn quickly. Um, so I'll s skip through the formalisms here. Um, but I think I, I do want to touch on like why domain randomization might be meta-learning. Um, so the formulation of domain randomization as meta-learning is that like each set of physics parameters corresponds to some environment, and you know one so one like attempt at solving the task in that environment, um, one one attempt at solving the problem in that environment is a task, and so you know during the rollout itself, like when you're trying to solve that problem in your new environment. Um, the recurrent state of the policy allows you to adapt to whatever new physics you're seeing. Um, and so there's, there's a little bit of evidence that this might actually be the case, that this might actually be happening in uh, when policies are trained in simulation and then deployed in the real world. Um, there are some sort of tools that you can use to do domain randomization. Um, 
like if you're using different simulators, Gazebo, um, Unity, Unreal, um, or sort of custom self-driving simulator. And um, I recommend checking these out if you want to apply this. Um, and then there are also some challenges to applying domain randomization. And so, you know, in practice, like how does this process actually work, right? So, for the first thing that you do is you build a simulated world, and then you take your simulated world and you calibrate that to the real environment, um, and then you design some randomizations that, like, you think intuitively might sort of like cover the real world variability. Um, then what you do is you train a model in that simulation and you evaluate it in the real world. And then finally, you kind of have to go through this manual iterative process of examining the failure mo uh, modes in the real world and trying to design new randomizations that allow you to, um, to get around those failure modes. And so I think kind of the core challenges here are that this process is very manual, right? So you need to do all the 3D modeling yourself. Um, you need to do this system ID problem, which itself can be challenging. Um, you need to decide what to randomize, which can, which can uh, require a lot of judgment. And you need to decide how much to randomize it. And then finally, you need to, like, um, as was pointed out, once you evaluate in the real world, you need to somehow like, go back and figure out what you should do um, when the model is failing. Like, what additional randomizations should you add? Um, and so there's been some recent work that's tried to extend domain randomization to um, kind of alleviate some of these challenges. And, um, I think what I'll do is I'll just kind of give a high level sense of like what are the, what are the ways that people are trying to address the challenges of domain randomization. Um, and then um, I have also some references to some specific papers where people are trying to do this that you can dive into if you're curious about the specifics of the approaches that people have taken. Um, so the first kind of, um, the first class of techniques that people have tried to make domain randomization better is to say like, well, maybe we can d design specific types of neural network architectures that are better suited to transfer, so that work better for this particular type of task that we're doing. Um, so an example of a paper here is this randomized to canonical adaptation networks um, from uh, some folks at Google. And the idea here is instead of you know, taking a randomized simulation um, and training your model on that to directly output what it's supposed to do, instead, what if you add this intermediate step? And this intermediate step is we first train a model that maps this randomized simulation into some sort of canonical simulation. And then when we get in the real world, um, we'll take our real world data and we'll also map that into the canonical simulation. And, um, and, so, then, um, and so it turns out in their experiments, this performs better than just training on randomized data from scratch alone. Another class of techniques that people have tried is um, trying to match the simulator to real data. And so this is kind of like combining um, domain randomization and system ID. Um, one approach in this category is SimOpt, where they kind of iteratively, iteratively um, train on a randomized environment, use the policy from that randomized environment to collect data in the real world, and then use that real world data to try to update the parameters of the simulator to be a better match for what was seen in the real world. So this is kind of an iterative approach to automatically incorporating real world data into simulator design. Um, and they had some pretty interesting results from that. Um, and you know, another sort of another approach here is is uh, this idea of metasim, where this is really addressing the problem of world design using simulation. And so, you know, the challenge is that like if you're trying to design a self-driving car simulator and you're just placing you know objects randomly, then you're going to get a lot of scenes that look like on the left, right, where um, objects are not placed in uh, in a way that's physically realistic or that you would see in your real data set. And so the, the goal of this approach is to um, try to take these scenes that you generate naively and use a little bit of real world data to make the, the scenes that your simulator generates more physically plausible. Um, another thing that you can do, that you could think about doing is like, um, is actually using the, the real data itself to try to directly improve the performance of the model that you train on simulation on the task that you care about. Um, and so I think the um, one, one paper that I really like in this category is called Learning to Simulate. And so the idea here is, you know, in standard domain randomization, what we do is we sort of, um, we have this manual process of tuning the simulator param parameters, right? So we create some simulator parameters, 
and then we train a model on those parameters. We see how well it works in the real world. And then we try to use our intuition to go back and say, all right, can we design better um, simulator parameters? So what they, what they do in this paper is, instead of doing that tuning process man manually, they instead use meta-learning to um, find the parameter distribution. So they, they're optimizing over the distribution of simulator parameters that um, performs the best on the task that they actually care about. So they're, like, they're actually optimizing the distribution of um, simulator parameters itself based on this metric of how well does the model that I train on that simulator perform in the real world. Um, another kind of class of techniques in this category is um, providing some way of telling whether you're overfitting to the simulation before you, um, before you actually go into the real world. And so what this could allow you to do is um, if, if you know that you've trained too much on this simulation, then you can stop training and deploy into the real world before you've kind of overfit to the simulator. Um, and so this is a really interesting paper that follows that approach. Another thing you might think about doing is, right, so we have this intuition that it's really good if your simulator is harder than the real world, um, right? But most, most of the examples in your simulator maybe are not really that hard. And so the question here is like, can, is there some automated way of surfacing the hardest examples in the simulator so that you can focus your model's training on those hard examples. Um, and two papers that I like in this category, one is active domain randomization, where they um, have like their randomized simulators and then some refer reference simulator. And they train a model to try to tell whether the policy was being rolled out in the reference simulator, where you know that you should do well, or in one of the randomized simulators. And so if if, um, if this discriminator can tell the difference between the, the behavior of the robot in the randomized simulator, then that means that that simulator might be harder. And so you can focus more of your effort on, um, on training in that simulator. Um, I think I'm going to skip over this one. And then I think the, the last category of um, extensions to domain randomization that I'm excited about is so you know, we have this idea that the wider the range of simulation, the better. Right? So if we can train on a wide range of simulators, then it's more likely that our model will generalize to the real world. But the challenge is that um, in a lot of cases, if you make the distribution of simulations too wide, it becomes too hard a task for your network to do well on. Right? So if you, if you degrade the performance in simulation, um, then you can't expect it to, to do well in the real world either. And so this category of things is about trying to allow the model to perform well on a wider range of simulations. So you can continue to expand the range of simulations that you train on without hurting your model's performance in simulation. Um, and so two ideas in this category that I want to touch on. Um, one is essentially um, allowing the model when you're training in simulation to see which simulator it's in. Right, so instead of needing to figure out which simulator it's in, you provide the information about which simulator it's in to the policy. And so that allows the policy to kind of have less work to do, right, because it doesn't need to figure out which version of the world it's in. It already knows that. Um, but then on the real environment, obviously, you don't have that information. And so what they do is they um, run an optimization algorithm in the real world that allows them to um, find the, the, the value of that simulator parameter vector that allows the model to perform best there. Um, they have some results, some promising results in simulation that show that this can work well. Um, and then the last idea I want to touch on is auto, automatic domain randomization. And this is kind of the extension to domain randomization that allowed um, OpenAI to recently solve the Rubik's Cube with a robotic hand. And the, you know, the, the core concept here is that um, you know, since wide randomization ranges lead to per, poor performance, um, of a model that's trained on the entire randomization range, maybe we can allow the model to perform well on a wider and wider range of simulations, um, sort of by gradually growing the width of those simulations that it's trained on. So we start with a really narrow range of simulations, and then once we perform well on that narrow range, then we make the range a little bit wider. And so like, the idea here is that maybe that's an easier learning problem, and so we can, continually, we can continue to expand the number of simulators that the model is trained on. Um, I'll skip over the details here, um, but this is kind of the result that you can get by using something like this. Um, and so I think it's, uh, 
this is running in real time, so it's gonna, it takes a few seconds for it to actually start doing things. But this, um, this robot like, ultimately is able to solve the Rubik's Cube um, in hand. A couple of caveats to this result. Um, the first is that like, this doesn't actually work all that reliably. It's kind of maybe 20% of the time it actually is able to solve it successfully. Um, and then there were some kind of um, uh, explicit choices that need to be made around how the sensors were configured. Um, so it's not all, it's not like directly estimating the state of the world from vision. But I think impressive result nonetheless. Okay, the, the last thing I want to touch on is just kind of what's, you know, like what's coming in this field, right? So what's next? Um, I think, I hope that we're going to see more and better tools. Um, I sort of showed you a slide, I flashed a slide that has some tools for domain randomization, but um, I think that we can do better, especially on physics randomization. Um, I think, uh, you know, hopefully we can, like simulators will continue to get more and more accurate and more and more scalable, and so we can do larger and larger training runs. Um, and I think there's sort of a next generation of sim-to-real te techniques that are coming. Um, and so I, I'm really excited about sort of the research areas that I showed you earlier around automating different parts of like the very manual domain randomization process. And I think those are going to um, continue to get better. I see like domain randomization and domain adaptation and as well as like model-based reinforcement learning. Um, people kind of think about these things separately right now, but I think that they're all going to converge, right? There's no reason that you can't do um, uh, domain randomization and then also do domain adaptation on top of that. So I think um, ideas that sort of like approaches that combine ideas from these three fields are, are promising. And then in terms of use cases, right, um, I think this comes back to sort of what, what I touched on at the beginning as motivation for studying these techniques to begin with. I hope that people will start to prove out that you can use synthetic data for edge cases and for reducing bias and ultimately for getting robots to learn on really complicated like wide, messy, real world data distributions. Like, I think an awesome project for someone to do would be to try to get a, a remote controlled car to drive around Berkeley campus only training on synthetic data. Um, and then lastly, like the dream for all this, right? So um, right now it's this super manual process, but what like I think the North Star for this field is, is um, like what I would call like real to sim to real. And so the idea here is like, what you, the, where you want to be is where you can sort of collect some data about the real world. Like you ha maybe have some sensors that are observing your scene. And then you can use that sensor data to automatically construct a simulation and automatically decide what ranges of parameters to randomize. And then you train a model in those simulations and um, then use the policy that results from that to go and collect more real world, world data and then go back and, and sort of improve and widen your simulation. Um, and so my hope is that like, in the long term, um, this whole process is going to get automated. And we're going to be able to just build really powerful robotic systems on top of these techniques. OK, um, if you're interested in learning more about this, um, here are a few um, references that I recommend. And um, yeah, thanks. I think we're a little over time, but I'm happy to take questions kind of outside or um, offline by email after. Thank you, Josh. Yeah. Questions outside. That was great. Thanks. Yeah, I had like way too much there. Uh, realized halfway through, but tends to happen. Well, I think uh, we'll share the slides, right? So yeah.